internally shared meeting, so it's not something that will be public facing. So don't worry about if you want to put your camera on. Uh, we don't have to get any consent form signed or anything like that. Uh, so good morning. I'm glad we could all jump on today and talk about assisted living. Uh, I'm Meredith Finley. I'm the assisted living waiver manager here at ODA. And uh, I have some ODA staff on me uh, on with me as well. So uh, they're going to help manage some of the uh, admissions and help answer any questions that I may not be able to. So we are going to try and stick to the assisted living service topic today because next week we have another PAA provider oversight staff meeting as well where I will talk about some HCBS updates. Not to say that we can't talk about that if there's time at the end, but I really do want the focus to be on the assisted living service today. So just please keep that in mind uh, as we're going through some of these slides. All right, as always, please feel free to stop me if you have questions throughout the presentation. Uh, this is uh, going to be a collaborative effort again where we're going to interact and have conversation. I have some Q&A at the end where I might be calling on some of you who submitted questions and I appreciate uh, any of your, your feedback that, that you want to share. Uh, raise your hand, throw it in the chat, unmute, whatever you feel comfortable doing is fine by me. So today's agenda, we're going to go over some updates to the resident rights because it is resident rights month. If you didn't know, uh, I have a few updates about PIMS, go over a little bit of some of the rule questions that I received and the rule uh, updates we'll see later on in the memory care service. Uh, go over some questions about criminal records checks and then Q&A. So there are some updates that I wanted to share about resident rights, which is timely uh, because it is resident rights month. Um, I guess yes. it's every October and it's an annual event that was designed by Consumer Voice to honor resident rights uh, and those residents that are living in all long term care facilities, uh, as well as those that are receiving care in their own home in, in the community. Uh, it's an opportunity for all of us to focus on and celebrate the dignity and rights of every individual receiving long term services and supports. Uh, so this year's uh, theme is amplify our voices and the uh, I guess meaning or definition behind that is that it emphasizes a community of long term care residents coming together to make their voices heard. Amplifying your voice means being outspoken about your preferences, hint, 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 HCBS settings, uh, and your choices, and sharing who you are and your experiences. Residents' voices are the most important at the decision-making table, and your story deserves to be heard. So if you are out doing an assisted living review or if you're doing a passport uh, waiver review, doesn't matter, uh, feel free to take that opportunity and educate staff or residents on the on this theme, on the fact that resident rights do exist. Uh, feel free to build relationships with those residents, with family, with staff. Um, promote community involvement in long term care. Again, you can see some of the overlap with the HCBS requirements there where we're trying to get folks out into the community. Increase community awareness about residents rights and highlight the facilities dedication to promote residents rights and person centered care. Has anybody seen resident rights or heard that this is happening? Uh, I'm just curious by show of hands or feel free to throw something in the chat that you are aware of this, you've seen messaging around this, posters, anything. Has your um, local ombudsman talked to you about it? Nothing. OK, well, I'm glad we touched on it then. Um, and so that leads us right into some of the changes related to the uh, Ohio Revised Code with resident rights. This is really uh, exciting because 
the discharge process specifically that's outlined in the resident rights that um, is available for all of the folks that we serve now gives the residents a little bit more power in ways that they didn't have before. So I don't know the exact effective date, but you will see this sometime this month. So if it has already happened, I, I haven't checked today, um, but these are new changes to resident rights that might come in handy that you know of now um, when you're dealing with a provider, uh, particularly assisted living provider or an individual. So moving forward, discharge notices cannot include locations which cannot meet the health and safety needs of the individual. Historically, before we have seen discharge notices that include homeless shelters, that include hotels, and in many situations, the resident's health and safety needs cannot be met in those settings. So now providers are required to identify locations that can meet um, those needs. And that is the language that you will see in the revised code. Um, now, it's not to say that they can't discharge to a hotel if they have evidence to support that their health and safety needs can be met. But um, this will eliminate a lot of providers just dumping folks on the streets, which has happened a lot um, and eliminates the ability for them to do that. Next update is that there must be adequate pr preparation prior to the discharge notice being issued. So historically, providers have just issued a discharge notice. There hasn't been conversations with the individual or the family. Um, and now the facility is required, is responsible for working with families, working with individuals to identify other locations that they can um, have their health and safety needs met. So there has to be an attempt by the provider to show that they've worked with the individual, with the family. Um, ultimately, we hope that this will reduce um, last minute uh, discharge notices being issued, uh, less stress on the individual and the families, less confusion so that they aren't taken um, aback by this sudden notice being issued to them. So again, the provider has to take more of an active role in the discharge process. Hearing officers are required to ensure the location of the proposed transfer or discharge complies with the rights that are identified above in the rule. Uh, so again, historically, hearing officers have not re been required to look at that during the hearing itself. And now hearing officers are required to ensure that any of the locations that are identified on the discharge or transfer um, meets the health and safety needs of the individual, uh, ensure that the provider has taken um, steps to prepare uh, the individual prior to issuing the discharge notice. So these are really powerful changes to the revised code that ultimately will um, help the resident have a better experience receiving the services from the provider um, and give them peace of mind, hopefully, that, that they're not stranded and alone uh, in this as well. Let me pause there, see if there's any questions about that. Again, keep an eye for it. Uh, you might be hearing about these changes coming up. I wanted to take this opportunity to share that with you. It's not something we typically typically talk about, but because of the focus on assisted living, I thought it was appropriate. So let's go over some PIMS updates. As you know, the update for uh, PIMS version 5.22 is coming out on the 16th, which is next week. Um, so please make sure that you're taking the steps necessary to get that updated version uh, on your laptops, computers, et cetera. Um, for those of you who haven't had time to go through what is going to be updated in the rule, um, I wanted to, oh, where am I doing that later? You know what, I think I'm doing that later. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, but do make sure that you are reading the attachment that was in the email sent from ISD at ODA about some of the changes because it will impact the way that you document um, information in PIMS, particularly when it comes to HCBS. Um, oh, you know what? Sorry, I'm talking out loud. I talk about that next week when it comes to documentation in PIMS for HCBS. So I'm 
again, getting ahead of myself. Uh, so we are in the process of working on getting the HCBS settings evaluation that's currently in the COP evaluation moved into the assisted living service evaluation and adult day service evaluation. Uh, we're like this close to getting that done. So please uh, stay tuned for that. I will send an email once the green light goes and we are going to see that updated. Um, I received lots of great feedback from all of you. So thank you for taking the time to look at that. Um, and, and you'll be seeing that in the near future. And again, we can make updates to that at any time. So if you are finding that once this rolls out, it's not meeting your needs, please, please, please just send me your thoughts as they come up and I will incorporate those changes and, and we'll get it updated in PIMS. Um, the, uh, the, the evaluation in PIMS also will align with the rule and will align with the uh, checklist that we created. Um, while we're talking about this HCBS settings checklist that uh, you use internally, I do want to share that I have some new information about HCBS and how we are to monitor that. I'm going to work on updating that checklist and actually remove some things and update the language, uh, particularly around meaningful distinction. So I should get that out in the next couple of weeks. So just a heads up that uh, that information will be updated as well and will not require as much of a thorough review when it comes to category C settings. So that's a win. Um, Again, the uh, HCBS evaluation in PIMS is designed to be used for both category B and category C settings. There will not be any uh, distinction between the two settings when you enter them in PIMS. Again, if you find that there's something that needs to be called out in PIMS, I can change that language, but I think it's best that we get this updated in PIMS, roll it out, see how you're all doing with it, and, and we can provide, you can provide feedback um, when you want. Also, while I know I'm talking about HCBS right now, and we'll talk about it next week, uh, another note I want to make is if you are doing a Category C review and you want to look at either the document that we sent to CMS during the heightened scrutiny process in 2018. Uh, if you want to see a policy that we created, um, the uh, I'm sorry, if you want to see a policy that the provider submitted from way back when, please send me an email and I'm happy to send any of the information um, as, as you request. Sorry, I'm a little distracted with the, the question. Let me pause and see what is going on in the chat. Oh, it's not progressing. Oh, some people are, some people are. OK, if you're having problems with seeing the slides in any way, shape or form, I recommend you log out of the presentation and log back in. Sometimes that will help fix uh, any glitches. All right. I wish I had better news to share about this right now, and I take full responsibility. I am sorry. I know that there have been tons and tons of questions around which rules in the Department of Health that you are supposed to review in conjunction with our assisted living service. Um, I will tell you that it is uh, a work in progress that I'm working on every single day. Um, my goal is to get every single rule that is required for your review as it pertains to the Department of Health rules um, in PIMS so that there is no question about where you start and stop your review with the Department of Health rules, where you start and stop your review with Department of Aging rules, um, PIMS will be that guide for you. Um, so in the meantime, continue to practice, to continue your current process as you have been doing until I get this update in PIMS for you. Um, are there questions about that right now that I can answer um, or comments? I, I received a lot of great questions and I uh, will tell you again that I'm incorporating those into the evaluation itself for PIMS and will reflect that, uh, you know, whether it's a, a, a 
criminal background check reason code, you know, specifically call that out in PIMS, whether it's, uh, you know, what trainings do I need to look at? All of that will be in PIMS for you so that you are not guessing. Okay. I also think that that will help eliminate issues with shared providers. Uh, so, for example, I went to a site visit this week at Ohio Living, and they have multiple sites throughout Ohio, and we found an issue that we need to address, and the provider had said, well, another regional program told us one thing, and you're now telling us another thing, and in theory, getting all of the uh, information in PIMS um, in the evaluation will help address the inconsistencies across the state so that you are not having to um, provide different technical assistance based on how your PA is operationalized these reviews it will all be in there for you um, of course we will not have every little nuanced detail but um, that's my goal is that shared providers will not have questions about how they are to monitor the waiver rules because you will all have the same review across the state Thoughts or questions, comments about this? Okay. I did get a question about room and board, and I wanted to share the rule information um, that says every um, individual who is enrolled in the waiver is required to pay for their own room and board. And the waiver is covering the service itself. And that is the rule that we all review in uh, chapter 173.3902.16. Room and board payments vary depending on an, an individual's finances. So, um, you know, there are a minimum amount of money that an individual does have to pay. Um, but what is included in this room and board payment? So the Department of Health has a rule uh, that you see here that includes supplies and so providers are required to include things like linens some furniture um, reading lamps this is all outlined in rule i just took a few of them to, to show on the screen um, but i encourage you if you have questions uh, from individuals families about what's included in room and board what's uh, the department of health have they are found in uh, in that a Department of Health rule. Not to say that individuals cannot bring their own items. Of course, we encourage that to make it more home-like, um, but this is the bare minimum, including things like toiletries and paper products. A lot of questions came in about criminal records checks. So I want to remind you that the notice that was published way, way, way back in the day in 2018 um, is still applicable today. When I send this PowerPoint out, I will also send this notice that's referenced just in case you don't have it. But it does state specifically at the very bottom of the notice that for assisted living providers who are providing this particular service through our waiver, the criminal records check reason code can only be 3721.121. So please make sure that that is the guidance that's being provided to um, the assisted living providers, anybody who is delivering service, personal care service to an individual on our waiver needs to have this reason code. Um, so if a provider is using a different reason code, um, then you can issue, uh, you know, guidance to that provider. Um, feel free to email me and walk through some ideas about ways we can get it updated, fixed, etc. cetera. Um, again, this is the reason code that's required. You'll also see that on the Department of, of Aging on our website. Um, it's it's uh, when you're going to uh, uh, become an assisted living provider, that reason code is also called out on our website. Um, 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 so uh, 
this rule 3701-1304, sorry, uh, assisted living providers must submit, which means initiate the criminal records check request to uh, BCII not later than five business days after the individual begins conditional employment. I wanted to call this out because a lot of you are responsible for uh, also monitoring passport providers, not just assisted living providers. So Department of Health has different rules than Department of Aging when it comes to when initiating a criminal background check. So you do need to switch your hat if you're reviewing an assisted living provider, um, you need to ensure that the uh, background check is initiated no more, no later than five business days after that individual um, begins employment. Versus passport providers is prior to service delivery. I'm seeing some hand ra hands raised, so feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Meredith, um, this is Donna from uh, PA3. Um, we were told back in the day that that five day um, was for when a provider did the actual inking fingerprints and they had five days to send them. That the inking needed to be done right away, but mm -hmm. then they had five days to submit those fingerprints and that's where the five days. But you're saying they have five days to send somebody to like the sheriff's department to actually get their um, fingerprints complete or submitted. Let me confirm. I'm reading this rule that Kelly put in here too. Um, one second. I just had a fingerprint impressions and that the criminal records check is required to be conducted if the individual comes under final consideration for employment. Uh, Donna, let me go back to your question. Uh, do you have the rule for that uh, impression sheet, the ink piece? Or can no, you send that I, to me? I don't have that. That's just kind of direction we've received from way back when. Um, OK, I don't know if Shirley or who it was back in the day. Um, it was like okay. a verbal, um, so I don't think we have anything, but that's kind of where we were at. But okay. if it's different, that that's fine. I that's will, great. But let me look into that. I apologize, I don't have an answer right now. I want to look at the rules and make sure that um, if there was guidance sent out via email at one point too, that that is also rescinded as well. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, OK, and LaVon, I saw your question. The uh, correct code for assisted living providers is 3721.121. And LaVon, will also be mailing, uh, emailing this PowerPoint out too, so you can see it too. Um, OK. All right, thank you everybody for putting the rule information in there. That is always helpful so I can reference it. This has always been a uh, difficult topic to uh, provide guidance on because rules change, because we have overlap with the Department of Health and making sure that um, it aligns with, with what our rule expectations are. So um, this is something that always is a, a challenge. So I uh, will get some clarity on that. Um, and I um, I would encourage that if you have guidance in an email, if you could send that to me too, so I can evaluate what was shared and make sure that moving forward, we have a consistent and clean uh, copy of information for all of you to do your jobs and not have any confusion around this. Um, other questions about criminal records checks while we're talking about this? OK, if you think of something, shoot me an email. Happy to get it all figured out and cleaned up. So I guess I would say that last bullet point, I will uh, put pause on that until I've had a chance to look at this uh, other guidance about the, the, the actual uh, ink prints and make sure that it's consistent. 
Yes, and Shelby, I will absolutely put it in an email so that you can have that guidance moving forward. So Kelly, if there is a provider who's an assisted living uh, service provider that has used a separate reason code other than 3721.121, um, I would take it on a case by case basis. Um, you know, the the provider may have received uh, incorrect guidance and I'm not trying to have you all issue discipline left and right. So I think if you want to use your judgment on whether or not you want to issue discipline, if the provider is showing a good faith effort and says they're going to get it fixed, if you want to talk about it with me about what to do, I think that um, that's appropriate too. But um, I don't want the whole state of Ohio issuing discipline for this reason um, for every single provider. So I think use your professional judgment. Make sure that if you are unsure that you're asking for guidance, because I don't want you to feel like you're doing anything wrong, um, but feel free to to just uh, weigh that decision yourself. Yeah, Anthony, about the database checks or five year rerun, I will also research that. I believe I know the answer, but I don't want to speak um, out of turn here. So um, in my email with the answer to the ink fingerprints, I will also touch on the database checks and the five year rerun as well. Let me make a note here. It's so tricky because we have this understanding of how passport providers um, need to be reviewed and it makes us then question this assisted living waiver but it's good because uh, it brings up really good points and guidance for us um other stuff coming in if they have a different code would make them rerun the background checks or just use that code moving forward again um we would expect that that reason code be used because that's what is going to um, review the particular offenses that department of health has identified that they won't reviewed so i would ask that providers rerun under that code if you want to work with providers to come up with a timeline, that is OK, um, particularly if you're dealing with a lot of staff. Um, so feel free to, again, run that by me if you're not sure, um, but use your professional judgment about the um, the length of time it may take some providers to to get that done. If they've used those other codes in the past and we tell them that they have to use the correct code moving forward, will that suffice? Again, I think that answers the same question. All right. I did put information in here about what rule site to use um, when issuing discipline. So in instances where you are going to uh, I, uh, cite for the wrong reason code, you can use this rule citation. Um, if you've had a provider who's initiated a criminal records check more than five business days, um, that one I, I'm going to put on pause until I get some more answers about that ink fingerprint. Um, so that one, uh, I guess we'll just ignore that for right now. Um, this third bullet point provider failed to request, which also means initiate any criminal records check. Um, then you would cite for um, for this rule here. And then when the provider failed to terminate an individual who is conditionally employed when the results of the criminal records check, not the FBI, just the criminal records check, were not obtained within 30 days after the date the request was made, after the date the initiation was made, then you can cite this. I don't hear a lot about that, but um, I did want to throw it in there because it is in rule. And uh, just in case it comes up, that's the rule citation that you can do. I'm sorry, that you can use in your uh, discipline. Pending your answer, could you also coordinate with Awala so there's less pushback locally? I will see what I can do about that. Uh, due to the influx of agency staff over you know, the COVID period, I wanted to draw your attention to this rule. Um, the Department of Health rule has specific criteria for how agency staff are to be treated when it comes to re criminal records checks. Um, I didn't want to go through a whole lot of detail, but did want you to at least know that this rule exists so that if you are reviewing a provider who has agency staff, 
um, that there is information around here around criminal records checks and what the provider is required to do. So feel free to email me if you have questions about that, but that's the rule that you can reference when you are dealing with agency staff. Should we begin using the Department of Aging rule, then reference OAC rules, or should those be what we first and only reference in on a letter? Right now, Shelby, um, I think it's okay to use any combination of that, whether it's our rule that then connects to the Department of Health rule, whether you only want to use the Department of Health rule, um, until we get further guidance on how to draft disciplinary actions that cite other agency rules. Um, you can continue to uh, use the process you've been using to this point um, and point to our rule and then to the Department of Health rule um, until, again, until very specific guidance is given, continue to do the process you've normally been doing. Memory care service. So as you may or may not know, there is going to be a new service that's going to be provided under the assisted living service, and this is going to be effective in January. Um, both a, a new rule and rate is going to roll out January 1st of 2024. Um, contingent upon CMS approval, there are going to be two service rates eliminating the three tiers that we currently have. There's going to be a base rate of $130 a day, and then there's going to be a memory care service rate of $155 a day. This is a significant increase, and our director advocated um, tirelessly to get these rates increased that have been untouched for many, many years. And so um, roughly, this is an 89% rate increase from the current rates, from the current tier rates. Uh, it's roughly the third highest payment for this service in the country. So this is pretty significant. And um, you may already be getting questions from providers about the money and when. So feel free to let folks know that January 1 is the rollout um, and that these are gonna be uh, three tiers condensed into just the two. I know there's gonna be a lot of questions around how we're gonna roll this information out, not only to provider oversight, for the clinical team, for the providers themselves. And uh, please know that we are developing training guidance for all of it um, before this January 1st rollout. We recognize that there's gonna be PIMS updates that we're gonna wanna train you on. Um, there's gonna be information that you're gonna need to put in an evaluation under the assisted living rule. And we plan to have all of that um, available to you before this January 1st um, deadline hits. Um, again, like I just said, the memory care service will be housed under the assisted living service. It's all going to be under one rule, um, and therefore it will be all under the same service evaluation within PIMS. So um, please know that that it's not going to be, at least right now, a separate service. Um, are there questions? I don't want to go into too much detail because the rule is not finalized yet. Uh, CMS has not approved these rates yet. So things like staffing ratios, um, other details that are in that memory service, nothing has been finalized yet. So I can't necessarily answer any of those specific questions, but know that we will be providing you guidance on that. Uh, but are there questions about this that I can answer more broadly or generally right now? Okay. Many of you have asked for some resources that you can give to providers who need some HCBS training. Um, great news is that we have a new employee here at the Department of Aging who's going to be working on developing training specifically for our providers, and we will be posting that on our website when it's done. So we will have something official from ODA. 
Um, the uh, the resources that you see here can be per, can be shared with the providers in the meantime. Um, so there's not a whole lot that we have. Um, certainly providers are encouraged to seek other trainings that are available, but um, our, our website has information about the requirements. Um, I put the federal regulation information in there as well as the Department of Medicaid. So feel free to take this information and share it with your providers who need to have trainings or evidence that they've had trainings, uh, including the content. These are appropriate resources that you can, can share. Again, um, I'm really excited. We have Barbara on our team now who's gonna be working on um, training for providers amongst many other things. So uh, this is uh, gonna be one less thing that you have to worry about. You can just direct providers eventually to the to Department of Aging website and they'll be able to have everything uh, available in one spot. So I got some questions that didn't quite fit into any particular topic, so I wanted to save that for the end, um, just kind of a miscellaneous area. Are PAAs issuing discipline if staff orientation, again, this is for assisted living, is not completed prior to the start of services? So remember, Department of Health rules states that staff orientation doesn't have to be completed until three days after employment begins. So we just wanted to get a pulse check and see what folks are doing, not necessarily to say you're wrong, you're right, but just to bring attention to um, this difference when it comes to passport um, and see what folks are doing or if they have questions. Uh, the rule citation is there for you to reference if you need it, um, but I, I got this question, so I wanted to pose it to the greater group and see what, what folks are doing. And if you're not issuing discipline for it, uh, this is your reminder that this rule does exist and there's the rule citation. Okay, okay. I'm not finding this problem, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Angie Jenkins. I am um, at PAA 6. I have been citing for this just because I thought I was supposed to. I just recently started doing assisted living. Um, and I'm also finding when it comes to orientation, I'm finding that a lot of our providers are going to a Relias um, online training system, which is not covering all of the components that are listed in rules. So um, it's been a challenge to try to figure out how they're even meeting the, um, the rule qualifications. Is anybody else having that problem? I'm so glad you brought that up. CSS, do you want to chime in on how you've been handling that since we talked about that this week? Yeah, um, I've developed a form that basically says I have covered this, all this stuff, because it's usually covered somewhere in the Relias or I've come across other trainings. And most of the providers have agreed just to sign off on that form to, um, you know, show compliance with um, that requirement. So I can share my form if if that would help. Um, you know, it's some providers, um, you know, don't like to um, use a form, but um, or I make them, if they don't want to use that, then I make them tell me, okay, where's this at in Relias, <clears throat> you know, so. But most of my providers of like, OK, if that makes it easier, they'll just use my form and um, sign off on that. Yeah, great backing off of what Kathy said, um, this is PA2. I uh, have run into this and I have had them sit down and, with their laptop and show me these programs and where it fits. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I have been doing that. That's you guys. Those are great um, ideas. I have been doing that and they are not finding where it fits. <laughs> so It's been a struggle that um, and that's where I've, I have been citing for that. Um, and um, one of you wonderful people had given me a form. So I have been sharing a form like that to have them kind of like an attestation. Um, yes. OK, yep. Thank you. 
feel free to unmute. So I have a uh, quick question then. So if on that form you have that uh, they're promising that they're teaching that subject that may not be specifically written on their policy or on their test. And if they can tell you how they address it, even though it's not specifically written on the test, would that still qualify then? So they're covering it in a training, but they're not being tested on it? No, no, no. Uh, where's, where the previous person, uh, I didn't catch a name, uh, had said that they have a form, so they're being trained, they're being tested, um, and it's not specifically written on the form or in the uh, program that you had, but they're actually doing it. If they can show you that they're doing it, then that attestation form would be signed to say that they are doing it. Ashley or Kathy, do you want to chime in about how you're addressing that? The form is saying that they are acknowledging that they've been trained in that. I'm not real sure I'm understanding your question. So if they sign the form that says that they've been trained on that. Yeah. But they're in the training program. It doesn't, let's say it's sweeping the floor. And let's say that in the training program, it doesn't specifically say they're sweeping the floor. But they say, well, of course we teach them how to sweep the floor. Would that be okay if they signed that form that said, yeah, we, we taught that? No, they would still, you know, have the training. They do still have the training in the Relias or whatever they have. So are we will provide to them what they need at, at certification and we provide an annual training. So um, it would be covered, but we try to provide the technical assistance of, um, of using a form, but. Right. Okay, thank you. Sean, if there's a specific example or provider, feel free to run that by me if if there's concerns around them meeting the intent of the rule. Um, happy to dig deeper okay. and look Thank at you. that. I'm excited that ODA is going to have the training online and that's a big help. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading through some of the comments. I'm glad, Kelly, thank you for adding that. Utilize separate form showing the specific topics. Anthony, we too have provided guidance on standard coverage of requirements. Okay, great. Another question was around staffing levels for assisted living providers. Um, so while there is not a specific staffing ratio uh, in our rule, in health rule, um, I did want to bring your attention to this rule, uh, which is our uh, administrative code that talks about the provider maintaining adequate staffing levels, which comply with Department of Health rule. Um, so make sure that when it talk when when you have concerns around staffing levels, uh, really a lot of the meat and potatoes is going to be in that Department of Health rule. And um, I wish I had a a cut and dry answer for you, um, but the adequate staffing levels and then what's cited in the Department of Health rule uh, make it that it's it's really a case by case basis. Um, and we will be providing guidance on that when it comes to the memory uh, care service rule as well. I don't know if there was a specific question that came around that, but uh, that is the the rule that you can turn to. If you have questions around staffing levels. I will say that there are providers right now that I'm involved with that do not have adequate staffing levels. And that's evidenced by interviews that I've had with residents. That's evidenced by Department of Health uh, survey citations. Um, so if, if you have providers where you are very concerned about the health and safety needs of the residents, um, feel free to send me an email and I can look to see if there was a recent Department of Health citation issued against that provider. Um, and if we have a, a persistent history of staffing levels not meeting the needs of individuals, 
um, I'm happy to provide you guidance or potentially even issue discipline from the Department of Health. I'm sorry, from the Department of Aging and um, look at maybe some other issues because usually staffing issues aren't the only issues at these settings. Um, it's usually just the tip of the iceberg that have impact elsewhere. So um, feel free to to reach out if you need some help with that and you have concerns. Yeah, Kelly, uh, being anxious about the staffing ratios uh, with those requirements, how much notice will the ALs receive and having that 20%? You raise great questions. Um, I don't know the timeline of notice that the assisted livings will receive, but I know that our director is working closely with stakeholders and um, assisted living associations to ensure that they have answers to their questions and getting information in front of them um, with as much advanced notice as, as we possibly can. We have a pretty quick deadline with January 1st rolling around, but it is uh, a top priority for uh, for me in particular, as well as other uh, ODA staff. So we are aware of the, the nuances to this new rule and how that could impact um, getting information rolled out to everybody to make sure it's it's clear and consistent across the state. So I had a question come in from Region 6, and uh, it was about providers charging monthly fees to residents who want to use a pharmacy um, of their choice, meaning that the pharmacy isn't the one um, that the provider itself has. So we wanted to see if this was a widespread issue throughout the rest of the state, um, and if it if it is, I want to talk a little bit more about it, and if you know information about why they're getting charged a fee, um, please share that information. The question from six, um, we were able to find out which provider it was and I, and I had a few more questions for them to to go back and ask. So um, if there isn't anybody coming across that, that's great, but if you are finding that, um, my recommendation to you would be um, what the fee is paying for, um, because it could potentially deter individuals from being able to exercise their right to choose their own pharmacy. So I just wanna make sure that um, individuals are having their rights adhered to, respected, supported, um, and if there is a charge, we need to just investigate a little further. So got a question about adding additional rooms to uh, an assisted living provider and the process for that. Um, we are working on a rule that will address the um, steps regarding uh, adding additional rooms, but also we're working on updating the PAA manual that will go in more detail about the process that um, the PAA must take in, in doing that. So uh, please stay tuned for that. In the meantime, please send any um, room additions that you want to have added to PIMS to the provider enrollment team, um, the certification team at ODA. They are responsible for um, reviewing that request and then adding it into PIMS. Additionally, while we're on this topic, I got a question about getting that notes box um getting access to that because right now if you have dozens and dozens of rooms identified in that notes box uh you cannot scroll down to see how many uh to see the entire text within that box so it has been added to our list for pims updates and if you need to see all of the room numbers that are waiver approved, then please send an email to, uh, you can send an email to me, you can send it to provider cert, um, you can send it to provider oversight, uh, and we will get you a list of the, new, the, the room numbers that are in there. So I apologize about that extra step you have to take, but it is going to be addressed um, in a future updated uh, PIMS version. So we kind of went over this. 
Uh, if a resident is admitted, I got a question to skilled nursing facility short term, the provider cannot bill the daily rate. Oh boy, Kelly, you're just you're throwing me for a loop here. I don't want to answer that until I've done my research with the rule, but I will uh, email you that response. Thank you for the. The question. Uh, and then lastly, do you want to continue to have some of these more uh, quarterly check ins around assisted living service specifically? Uh, do you have thoughts about other tools or resources or things that ODA that we can do to help address your needs? Um, whatever it is, I, I'm just curious about your thoughts on moving forward and whether these types of touch bases are beneficial outside of the uh, PA quarterly meeting, since this is such a very specific service, um, I think it can deserve some um, more guided attention, if if that makes sense. OK, thank you for the feedback. Yes, yes, um, I am sure not only for my own sake but come january when that memory service rule rolls out that there's going to be a ton of questions and so we might do it um monthly um as it relates to the memory service uh you know we we will determine a cadence based on the amount of of questions we get so um i have that in the back of my mind that that might be uh needed to increase in the frequency of us meeting so i can also do that as well um okay Great. Our goal again with with getting these up and running um, now that that I'm in this role is to just make sure that um, you have all of the things that you need to do your jobs well, that um, we bring general questions to the group, because I think uh, just like Angie posed that question with training, we were able to get some some best practices throughout the state. So I, I think that's really helpful um, in hearing how other programs are are operationalizing some of these requirements. So um, I, I benefit from it as well. Um, have the clinical staff received training on the memory service yet? No, nobody's received any training uh, on the memory service at this point, but there will be training for them as well, uh, not only in how to assess for which service they need, whether it's the base or the memory, how to do that, how to put it in PIMS. There's a lot that's going to be rolling out soon about that. Other thoughts or ideas, uh, feel free to unmute or put something in the chat. And you can always email me if you want to. Please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I'm here to help, so I want you to use me as a resource. Again, next week on the 17th, starting at 10 a.m., we will be at Region 9 and we will have a virtual option to do lots of different uh, topics, PNM, HCBS, provider oversight, all sorts of stuff. So uh, I will touch base on some HCBS trends and guidance as well, um, but we hope to uh, see you in person and online as well. Are PAs issuing disciplinary actions if an AL misses a quarter for the quarterly care conferences, or are you just giving technical assistance? The rules do not quote that the resident must sign the quarterly care conferences. What are other PAs requiring? Anybody want to chime in on that? I will. This is Shelby from Five. Um, for the quarterly conferences, if they're not doing them, it, it really depends how widespread it is. If they've missed one quarter, you know, I might issue a 60 day and make them give me a plan for future compliance. Uh, but if they're missing them on everyone, it's a lack of, of training. The previous DON has left and they didn't share that information or what, you know, whatever the reasoning is, if it's widespread, I might do the seven day, but usually the 60 day, um, especially since if somebody did just leave without notice and somebody else is stepping in, that certainly you could look at a technical assistance there, but 
if it's widespread, it, they need to know how important that is, in my view. <laughs> Thanks, Shelby. I am also, if they're missing a quarterly, um, I am citing um, in the summary letter for that. And um, as far as the consumer signing, uh, the rule doesn't specifically state it, but it does say that they have to meet with the resident. So I would expect that the consumer would sign or there would be some documentation, like in a, a, a note that they did that in the nurse's note saying met with consumer on this date but something to indicate that they weren't just doing the paperwork sitting at their desk, that they actually met with the resident. Thanks, Angie. There's some uh, comments in the chat as well, Kelly, so that you can look at that guidance. All right, if there are other questions, you can send me an email and uh, I will get an answer to you. I appreciate your participation and your feedback as always. I will be working diligently on getting PIMS updated for uh, the assisted living service rule and Department of Health rule and as well as the COP piece for the HCBS. So stay tuned for that. And if you have other ideas of topics you want me to go over, happy to incorporate that in a future presentation as well. So hope to see you all on Tuesday. I will get all of this information out, uh, recording, PowerPoint, notice, et cetera, as soon as possible. And with that, we can be done. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks.